Welcome to A Look Ahead. As you probably know, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the fourth quarter of 2012. It's a series entitled Growing in Christ. And this is lesson number 12 in that series for December 22 of 2012 entitled Last Things, Jesus and the Saved. You'll find this a very provocative and interesting lesson, I believe. So let's begin, and we would encourage you to grab your Bibles. Meanwhile, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, we know that the things we've been, we're going to talk about right now have been misunderstood and misrepresented in every possible way. We have a unique doctrine here, what we call our doctrine of the sanctuary. Other Christian groups think we're crazy for our belief in this doctrine. So let us see if we can make it as clear as possible. We ask for your Holy Spirit to guide our words as we try to, to explore the various meanings involved here so that we may represent you correctly as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As I'm sure all of us know, our church began with the preaching about the second advent of Christ. This lesson will focus on what we believe is happening between that critical year of 1844, the great disappointment as we call it, and the second coming. Some details about the second coming itself and the resurrection of the righteous dead. So we're going to talk about those three things. What might be going on right now, particularly in heaven. What's going to happen when Jesus comes again? Obviously, that's a huge topic, but we're going to touch on it briefly. And then, how are the righteous living and the righteous dead going to be affected by that second coming? William Miller began his preaching about the second coming because of his understanding and interpretation of Daniel 8 and 9. As a result of further study on that subject, Seventh-day Adventists believe that, and I'm reading from our, our official pronouncements published by the General Conference and agreed upon at the General Conference session, there is a sanctuary in heaven, the true tabernacle which the Lord set up and not man. In it, Christ ministers on our behalf, making available to believers the benefits of his atoning sacrifice, offering once for all on the, uh, offered once for all on the cross. He was inaugurated as our great high priest and began his intercessory ministry at the time of his ascension. In 1844, at the end of the prophetic period of 2300 days, and that's of course from Daniel 8, 14, he entered the second and last phase of his atoning ministry. It is a work of investigative or pre-advent judgment, which is part of the ultimate disposition of all sin, typified by the cleansing of the ancient Hebrew sanctuary on the Day of Atonement. And if you choose to uh, look at our website and get the handouts, you'll see there's a lot of verses that the church gives to support its doctrine. We as Seventh-day Adventists are unique in our understanding of Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary and our interpretation of the 2300 day year prophecy. To be honest, we need to recognize that our understanding of this doctrine raises a number of questions that our Christian friends have raised in the past. What does it mean to say that God is on his throne in the heavenly sanctuary when we also believe that God is omnipresent. Let's start there. What does that mean? How can we say God is way up there somewhere, but we also say God is right here also? <coughs> is that a contradiction? You're, you're being a little physical there, aren't you? By worrying about pick, that pick, question? Pick out whatever word you want. I'm asking you, how does that work? Oh, don't we feel that God is omnipresent? because of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Do the we... Father, you know, you're, are you saying the Father's not omnipresent? I say the omnipresence that we feel of God mm -hmm. is done by the function of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's say, let's say He's the one who does that most obviously in our understanding. Okay. okay. <coughs> is there any... So that leaves the other two up there to be taking care of the rest of the issues. Okay. What is Christ doing right now in the heavenly sanctuary? Do we know? Well, let's think. Ken, this, this, this problem of God being omnipresent and being in a localized place, that's probably 
impossible for us humans to completely and clearly define. But uh, uh, in the case of the sanctuary doctrine, we kind of define that. But that, we're not the only one. In, in the book of Revelation, it talks about mm -hmm. God's coming down and setting his throne here on the earth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that particular concept is not that God, the, th the thing that we humans wrestle with, how can God be omnipresent and kind of be in one place at one, one particular time, that's not some weird thing that no, the Adventists no, have cooked up. No, it's, it's, in, it's in the Bible, but it, it's still something that, you know, because that's going to affect what we're, how we're going to respond to the other questions we're going to look at. I have a question. Yeah. By, when we think like that, are we doing like when the way they did way back when they thought God was only on a certain mountain? Are we limiting God? Well, that's why I'm asking you to remember that God is, as we say, omnipresent. If God is omnipresent, and He is, then He is on the sanctuary. But we don't think of Jesus as omnipresent. He said, He's fully God. Yeah. He said to Thomas, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Lord, show so, us the Father and we'll so believe. I don't, I, I'm having a little uh, time understanding why we give omnipresence to the Father when that function seems to be held by the Holy Spirit. Saying that God well, can't be here? We're talking in finite terms, aren't we? The Holy Spirit wow. is God. That's right. So God so, is here. That's right. So if God wants to come down and leave the Holy Spirit up in heaven, <laughs> well, how can you do that? How can you do that? They're one and the same, but yeah, well, they're one and the same. How do you do Let, it? Let's move on because we w w the reason for posing that question is how it affects what we're, the rest of what we're going to say. So let's move into that. In the earthly sanctuary, we all know about that presumably from our study of the books of Moses. There were three phases of the sanctuary service. There was a substitutionary sacrifice, the lambs were offered, a priestly mediation, the blood was carried and various things were done by the priest, and finally a day of judgment, a day of atonement. Okay? In what sense is Christ's death on the cross substitutionary? Well, you know, I'm a newer Adventist okay. and studying the different um, churches I went to, I love the sanctuary doctrine. Uh, Samuel Bakayoki wrote two books, the uh, spring festivals, the fall festivals, and he related how the sanctuary um, actions related to the functions that were going on in heaven in order to save us. And Christ at the last is cleaning hearts, mm -hmm. preparing a people for his return. The whole thing is absolutely beautiful mm -hmm. and it fits together um, completely and so um, I, and, and then Adventists they go off this way that way I don't know but I think it's just a, a wonderful clarifying doctrine as to the functions that Christ and God and the Holy Spirit have to go through in order for our salvation. So you're can, can perhaps you? in answer to your question the sacrificial lamb I agree with Joanna about all of that but the Christ on the cross mm -hmm. The sacrificial. Well, can, can you define substitutionary here? I'm going to read that, some that's verses. A big fancy word here. Yeah, it is. The way that substitutionary is usually understood is that I deserve to die. Someone dies in my place, therefore I don't have to die. Okay. Let's look at these verses. Isaiah 53, starting with verse four to verse six. But he endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. Now, what does that imply? That it wasn't. That it, it wasn't. implies that it wasn't. <coughs> but because of our sins, he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. That's pretty clear. We are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. How does all that work? All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of, each of us going his own way, but the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. Now that's the first passage that almost everybody looks at when they talk about substitution. Now let's look at one in the New Testament. Let's try Romans, five, uh, Romans 3, I'm sorry, starting with verse 24. But the free gift of God's grace, by the, but by the free gift of God's grace, all are put right with him through Christ Jesus who sets them free. God offered him 
so that by his blood, there's, that's a word for, that's a, a code word for his sacrificial death, he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. God did this in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. Notice that. In the, pa in the past, he was patient and overlooked people's sins, but in the present time, he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. There's a second time he mentions that. In this way, God shows that he himself is righteous. That's the third time. And that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. And one more passage. So God is demonstrating that God is righteous through through Jesus' sacrificial death. Is that what those passages say three times? Yeah. And here over in, in 2 Corinthians now, chapter 5, verse 21, Christ was without sin, but for our sake, God made him share our sin in order that in union with him, we might share the righteousness of God. So that all seems pretty clear, right? No, no, that's not really. <coughs> a little foggy to me. Yeah. Well, in the broadest <coughs> sense, what he did in his I, life I, I, and I, death, I, am, I can relate to, and I do not have to die the second death because of what he did. Okay. Now, in that sense, he substitutes for me. I, I can see the first part, but I have a hard time seeing how I... I can see how, he's, how he does something <coughs> for me, but then I, how he shares in mine, but I don't see how I reciprocally I share in his. We follow. I, and maybe I'm looking for a physical thing there yeah. or something. Can, can you explain <coughs> why does God show his righteousness by Christ dying on a cross? Okay, well, we have talked on a number of occasions in the past about why Jesus had to die, and we could spend the whole rest of the time talking about it, but let me just hit one major point. God said back at the beginning that sin leads to death. Satan said in the very next chapter, Genesis 3, that's a lie. Jesus died that death which results from sin. Jesus died saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and when you have sin, it God forsakes. So where does the word righteousness come in at that point? <laughs> okay, well, hold on. Let's, so, so what happens there? What, the, the life and death of Jesus, and there are many, many aspects of this. I couldn't begin to touch on them, even a, a quarter of them tonight. Basically, the life and death of Jesus proves to us that God has told us the truth. That's really what we're saying here. Because forsaking Christ caused Christ to die. Well, the Father says, in essence, I'm going to treat Jesus as if he were a sinner. And you're going to be able to see what happens, what's going to happen to all the sinners at the end. Now you have a choice. You can choose to live the kind of life he lived, or you will die the death which he died. Because that's, that's the truth sin of it. unplugs us like yeah. a plug from an electric socket. So if we, have, if we cling to sin, we are pulling the cord on our own life. Yeah. Isaiah 59, verse 2, and lots of other places. Your sin separates you from but me. Nobody had ever seen that any place in the universe. Mm -hmm. until it happened to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he's the only one in the universe to which it has happened. But it was and that, that it and happen. by that, whatever it was, I don't have to die that death. Yeah. He substituted for me. So even though we have sin, if we have faith in Jesus, that cord will not be pulled. Right. We will be able to keep connected with God, even though we have sin, as long as we have Jesus in us also. Jesus demonstrated how God is involved in the death of the sinner. Yeah, right. If God okay. treated Jesus as if he was a sinner, God didn't lay a finger on him. Jesus didn't say, Father, why are you beating me up, or why are you burning me up, or why are you torturing me? No, he says, why have you let me go? Mm -hmm. And Paul fortunately says, well, God will let you go if you're, depend on, or you're yeah. bent on leaving. Yeah. But Norm said, he substitutes for us. What does he mean by that? Okay, that's, part that's the part we need to want, we need to talk about. Look at look at some more verses. First Timothy two five. 
For there is one God, and there is one who brings God and human beings together, the man Christ Jesus. So does that, that's, oh sorry. That's, that's part of what he's doing, right? So does, does that tell us that we're not supposed to be praying to the Virgin Mary and to this and this, because only Jesus. We're going to talk about the Virgin Mary in a little bit, so let's hold that for a moment. But, but how does that, how, where does the substitution come in on that? We're, we're, give, give us a moment. We're trying, we're okay. trying to get there. We, okay. we want to go step by step, otherwise we could just uh, get a, a jumble here. And so re I'm now reading Hebrews 7:25, and so he is able now and always to save those who come to God through him, because he lives forever to plead with God for them. So now we're talking about pleading, okay? We believe that Christ, as a result of these verses and others we could add, Christ is the sole mediator between the Father and the angels in heaven. We don't need the Virgin Mary. We don't have a lot of other saints. We'll, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. These verses suggest that through his mediation, he brings God and man together. Okay? Now, let's talk about what are the implications of that. What does it mean that, to say that Jesus is pleading before God on our behalf? Now, the word in Greek, pros, can mean with, I mean, you plead with somebody. It could mean you plead, you plead in front of somebody, just physically standing in front of somebody. It means you could, you could be, they could be behind you somewhere and you're out here making a presentation. So we have to decide what that means. Does someone need to plead with the Father before he will forgive us? No. Is the Son more loving and caring than the Father and that is why he is pleading for us? No, we would have to say if no. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. If that is true, how do we explain John 3.16 and John 14.9? Just look at those places. John 3.16, for God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. So who's loving? God. It's God the Father. He, gave, he gives who? Jesus. Emptied all of heaven. Yeah, so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. So... That can't be the, that, I mean, we can't say that God isn't loving after he did something like that, surely. And look at one that's already, verse that's already been suggested, John 14, verse 9. Jesus answered for a long time. Now here, here he is again. We're talking about the last night of his human life before he was crucified. Jesus answered for a long time. I have been with you all, yet you do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Why then do you say, show us the Father? Okay, so we are committed to the idea that there is no difference between the Son and the Father. Are we, do we agree with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ellen White says that I'm going to know him, page 338, if the Father had come instead of the Son, there would be no difference whatsoever in, in what happened. I have a question. Yeah. On the cross, when Jesus said, it is done, so it wasn't done? He didn't know that he, he was going to have to go to heaven and plead for us for thousands of years? Mm -hmm. What about that? See, that's, that's, that's the part we're going to try to get to. So bear with me here. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to move on. If the Father needs to be pleaded with, maybe our Roman Catholic friends are correct in suggesting that we should have lots of people called saints to help Jesus plead. Well, one of the main obstacles to accepting our understanding of Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary is the fact, we need to be honest, that most of our Christian friends believe in the immortality of the soul. And thus, people go, they believe, people go immediately to their reward when they die. So how could there be a judgment just before the second coming, starting maybe in 1844, how can you have a pre-advent judgment if people already received their reward? Doesn't make any sense, right? So, so if no you, wonder they have a problem with it. Yeah. Okay. So an even more perplexing theological question is this one. Why would an omniscient God need an investigative judgment? Isn't that a contradiction in, uh, in terms? It's not <coughs> judgment, for him. The judgment well, isn't for him. The, termino oh. the terminology is changing a little. Yes. It's now called pre-advent to get away from the right. investigation. Ju the judgment is not for him. He doesn't. He, he then doesn't. we better be very clear about that. 
In more recent times, we have suggested that it should be called a pre-advent judgment instead of an investigative judgment. Does that help? It should be clear that if the righteous are to be taken to heaven, let's think logically through this, if the righteous are to be taken to heaven at the second coming, someone, <clears throat> be it God or somebody else, is going to have to decide who are the righteous and who are not righteous. I mean, that, that should be that's perfectly logical. logical. That's, that's logical. logical. And okay? that, that, I mean, it's just yeah. as well. It's yeah. just. Yeah. It's fair. Everybody gets a chance to see. Mm -hmm. There are two chapters uh, dealing with these issues in the writings of Ellen White that I would encourage everyone to look at. One's entitled, it, what used to be entitled The Investigative Judgments, now entitled, if you get a, a, a new copy of, of Great Controversy, it will be entitled mm -hmm. Facing Life's Record. It's chapter 28 in The Great Controversy. The other one is entitled Joshua and the Angel. It's in Prophets and Kings chapter 47. These chapters are based on several verses, and now let's look at those verses and see what we can conclude ourselves. The first one is found in Daniel 7, starting with verse 9. And there's 9 and 10, and then it talks about something else for a moment. We're going to jump over that and look at 13 and 14. So, while I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever, who would that be? God. It has to be God. Sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow, and his hair was like pure wool. His throne, mounted on fiery wheels, was blazing with fire. Surely this has to be God. And a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of people there to serve him, and millions of people stood before him. If you look at the, if you look at the original, the more literal translations, it's 10,000 times 10,000. That would be 100 million. That's it's, just a start. It's not people, isn't it? Angels? Well, what is the word for the, people? I mean... Beings. Beings, yeah. okay. The court began its session and the books were opened. Now when the books are opened, what, what do we expect to happen? Somebody ought to take a look at them. That's a judgment scene, right? So we're going to drop down to verse 13 now. During this vision in the night, I saw what looked like a human being. He was approaching me, surrounded by clouds, and he went to the one who had been living forever and was presented to him. He was given authority, honor, and royal power so that the people of all nations, races, and languages would serve him. His authority would last forever and his kingdom would never end. Now who's that? Jesus. That has to be Jesus. Okay, are we all together on that one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's our first key verse. The next one is found in Zechariah 3, the first five verses. See? We're trying to get a picture of what's going on. So what we have now is a court scene in heaven God is sitting on his throne, Christ approaches him, and who's watching? The universe. The universe. More than a hundred million angels, and, and really, honestly, it's the entire universe That's right. is watching, okay? In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, angel here in this context is a word which means messenger. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. Now, we all know what filthy clothes represent in this Bible, right? Sinful man. Sinful, the sins of human beings, right? The angel said to his heavenly attendants, Take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. He commanded the attendant to put a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so, and then they put the new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. So, who's doing the accusing? Satan. Satan. And are we those sticks that were jerked out of the fire? We could um, be. If we... Uh, except Christ? Well, I'm going to ask you to read one more passage that this is all based on, okay, and then we'll have our discussion. Revelation 12, starting with verse 7. You can start with verse 1. It gives a little background, but let's start with verse 7. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Dragon is a word, another word for who? Satan. We're going to see that in just a moment. Who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated, and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven 
any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent. Does that remind you of any story earlier in the Bible? Genesis. The Genesis, the tree. exactly, chapter 3. Called the devil or Satan, John doesn't leave any questions about who we're talking about here, that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all the angels with him. Then what, what does he do when he gets down here? Then they heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. Now his Messiah has shown his authority. For the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers and sisters. Who's the accuser of the brothers and sisters? Satan. 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 Accused our brothers and sisters day and night has been thrown out of heaven. Our brothers and sisters won the victory over him by the blood of the Lamb, by the truth which they proclaimed. And they were willing to give up their lives and die. And so be glad, you heavens, and all you who live, that live there. But how terrible for the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, and he is filled with rage because he knows that he has only a little time left. Woe to us on earth, huh, with the devil and his angels down here. So what is actually happening in heaven right now? The throne was put in place and... Well, we've read these verses. Throughout the history of the great controversy, it has been Satan who has been the accuser of the brother. And I read, as the books of record are open. Now this is uh, Ellen White's uh, Great Controversy, pages 483 and 484. And this is, this is where she spells out what these verses mean. As the books of record are open in the judgment, the lies of all who have believed on Jesus come in review before God. Whose lives are reviewed? Ours. Humans. All those who have <coughs> believed in Jesus. Beginning with those who first lived upon the earth, our advocate, who's the advocate? The one who approached the throne in Daniel 7? Jesus. Jesus. Presents the cases of each successive generation and closes with the living. Every name is mentioned, every ca case closely investigated, names are accepted, names rejected. And mm. who's watching all this? The whole universe. The rest of the universe. The deepest interest manifested among men in the decisions of earthly tribunals, but faintly represents the interest evinced in the heavenly courts when the names entered in the book of life come up in review before ju the judge of all the earth. Why are they so interested in what's going on about us? They're learning how God deals with his creatures. Might be neighbors. Well, and some of us are going to be their future neighbors. Do they well, care? But in a very real sense, we are just like them. Only mm -hmm. something happened to us that didn't happen mm -hmm. to them and could happen to them. And that's what worries them. Yeah. And God's okay. mercy is shown. Well, they can see it. <coughs> I, don't, I don't think they're all that worried. <laughs> I think they trust God. I yeah. think they trust God. That's what happened and at what, the cross. I mean, these books, these aren't leather books that you open and turn pages yeah. and that kind of thing. What kind of media material this is. But I think what's happening is God, Jesus, look into the future of every case and know how that person would respond in heaven. And based on what they see and know with that kind of knowledge that none, no other creature has, they can make that decision. Yeah. And the angels and the rest of the universe and the faithful say, you said it, I believe it. Yeah. But it, you know, it is, I think it is important to to realize that this whole thing here, God doesn't need this judgment. No. He knows he kn what's right, he knows what's fair and right and what's just and so forth. You know, He's going through this process, this courtroom, so everybody else can see uh, the explanations if, if, if that's what would be involved or, you know, uh, the, the, the arguments for and against or whatever and how we've come to this conclusion. For the benefit of the jury. Mm -hmm. But you see, it had its beginnings in that sanctuary service out there in the desert. And it went through that first part when they were loading up the sanctuary with sins, as it were, at least the record of sins. And well, then that, they had to find, the, God had to say, this is not going to go on forever and ever and ever. 
So he has to, sh to put in an end time scenario. Mm -hmm. And that was the second apartment. What went on in there, finished it all off. Mm -hmm. That was the model. Yeah. And so now we're in that time in which in reality, the end up model is what's going on. Well, the divine intercessor, I read on in Great Controversy, the divine intercessor, that would be who? Jesus. Presents the plea that all who have overcome through faith in his blood be forgiven their transgressions, that they be restored to the Eden home and crowned as joint heirs with himself to the first dominion, Micah 4 eight. While Jesus is pleading for the subject of his grace, guess who else is trying to speak up? Satan accuses them before God as transgressors. Jesus does not excuse their sins, but shows their penitence and faith, and claiming for them forgiveness, he lifts his wounded hands before the Father and the holy angels, saying, I know them by name. I have graven them on the palms of my hands. Their names stand enrolled in the book of life, and concerning them it is written, they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy, Revelation 3, 4. If you Amen. wanted, you could take those words and make it sound like Jesus was telling God something he didn't know. No. But that's not true. No. I so mean, he's, plate he plate is plate stating the obvious from their standpoint because of their knowledge. So why the pleading? It's just a word. It's a word picture. He's, he's, no, he's, no, he's making this case. Mm. No, no, hold on, hold on. Let's be very clear. What's happening here? God is officiating. He's yeah. not, he's not, and if we go to Romans 8, literally it says, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Father are all on our side. Yeah. So let's yeah, be absolutely. very clear about like that. Like you say, they all agree with each other. Yes. So why does anybody have to plead? Well, just listen, I'm trying to tell you. The Father is officiating. Daniel 7 says the son approaches him, then the cases are brought up, the books are open. That's the time when they start talking about us. The rest of the universe says, surely you're not going to bring some of those sinners up here. And God says, yes, I am. And here's who, the... Who said that? The rest of the universe, the angels, all the rest of the beings in the universe. So he's pleading because the angels don't want us up because there? Because they don't understand it. They're afraid it may not be safe to bring us up there. Well, how do they know if it's safe for them, for themselves, to be up there? Well, let me read you what it says in <laughs> Prophets and Kings. Because there was a war before that, yes. and the, all kinds of their kind. And they have turned. survived thousands of years just fine. Mm -hmm. Satan has an accurate knowledge of the sins that he has tempted God's people to commit. And guess who has an even more accurate knowledge of it? God, right? And he urges his accusations against them, declaring that by their sins they have forfeited divine protection and claim that he has the right to destroy them. He pronounces them just as deserving as himself of exclusion from the favor of God. Are these, he says, these people who are, who are to take my place in heaven and the place of the angels united with me, are they going to, these people going to take my place? They profess to obey the law of God, but have they kept its precepts? Have they not been lovers of self more than lovers of God? Have they not placed their own interests above his service? Have they not loved the things of the world? Look at the sins that have marked their lives. Behold their selfishness, their malice, their hatred of one another. Will God banish me and my angels from his, his presence and yet reward those who have been guilty of the same sins? Thou canst not do this, O Lord, in justice. Justice demands. Who's demanding justice? Satan, Satan is demanding justice. Justice demands a sentence be pronounced against them. Prophets of Kings 588 and 589. So, so he's, 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 he's arguing against God. He's arguing he's, against Because God us. doesn't want, I mean, God wants to bring these people up. That's right. Okay, and you're saying that he's pleading because the angels aren't quite sure about that. He's making, he's making two cases. He's, Satan is trying to say, look, there's a bunch of sinners. How would you dare bring them back to heaven when you won't let me back in? That's his first argument. The second argument is, leave me out, even if you leave me out of it completely, would you dare to let these people into heaven? And the angels are all saying, amen, amen. <laughs> would it be safe? I mean, are you just going to start the great controversy all over again? Yeah, so yeah, how but, is yeah, that? But, yeah, so. But, but when they're saying amen, amen, is it because they don't have faith in God now? 
because it's God because, wants no, to bring them it's in. It's not because they don't have faith in God. It's because they've seen us. No, no, no. God yes, said. That's the, that's God the problem. said. Now there's, there's God no. said that He wants. You said that God wants to bring them in, right? Yes. Okay, so if they're balking at that, that means they don't have faith in God where's to do what they want to do. Where's the text that says they're balking? Where's the where's the text First or the we reference? Hear the devil and the angels got kicked out. Now Satan's back up there yeah. again. Now is well, God a, is God showing people, uh, showing all the beings that through His power and through what Jesus demonstrated, that our hearts are being cleansed and that through faith in Him we will become proper citizens for heaven. And God is showing that in the book to the rest I, of the beings. I don't, I don't understand that, that in, that, in that last week, in our last discussion, we, we talked about the fact that it's possible, and I would assume at this point in, these, in Christians' lives, that their, ver that their will is, is corresponding exactly to God's will. Well, so it ought to be obvious to everybody, I would think, when these people show up and say, you know, we'd like to come in, I would think everybody would be able to see their characters and there wouldn't have to be any of this nobody justice can read, business. Nobody can read the character unless you can read the heart. And there is no other creature on earth but God in the universe, right. but God so that can read the heart. My why works they have are the him? testimony to my do. faith. I don't, know, do. I don't know of a... S okay, well, let, well, let, I'm still just, trying, it's a trying court, to get it's the... a courtroom, if you will. I'm trying to get the so pleading. It's a metaphor. I'm trying to understand what the pleading is. Okay, let's, let's talk about several issues that we need to be very clear about this. Some people are going to ask, how can Satan be up there accusing us if he's been banned from heaven? Exactly. Okay? And my answer to that is very simple. When we pray, do we believe that God hears us? Mm -hmm. Yes. Satan can accuse us from right here, and God hears it very well, and the whole universe hears it just fine. There's no limitation to his communication powers. Satan is probably following us each day and go, look at that, God, look at that, look yeah, at that. Exactly. <laughs> so, so you're, you're saying the that, same that, way that our judgment is happening as we're living. It is, right now it's going Okay, on. so there's not a, there's not a courtroom convening at a certain time that you're it's, talking it about. Ha it started in 1844 and it is still going on. That's Adventist understanding. Yes. That's, that's what we're talking about. That's, okay. yes. It is, we believe that this period from 1844 to the end, whenever that happens, corresponds to the Day of Atonement in ancient Hebrew worship. Now in the Day of Atonement, ancient Hebrew worship, People were supposed to be trying to clean up their act, right. afflicting themselves and becoming better persons, asking for forgiveness for all their sins, so that when the priests came out, they were ready to greet the priest, yeah. and then there was a big celebration. So we're supposed to prepare ourselves so when Jesus comes back the second time, uh, we will be among the people that are allowed in heaven, well, and they, then we'll have a big celebration like the, what the is day it, the of Feast Atonement of Tabernacles? was also a demonstration, wasn't it? Yeah. Because it, there, was a, there was a thing with the lamb and the scapegoat that happened. Okay, so let's, let's, now let's, let's settle several <laughs> things that have raised big questions. Did God have to wait until 1844 to discover who's savable? No. 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 We absolutely believe in God's omniscience. So the judgment, whatever's going on in the pre-advent judgment, is not for his benefit. He already knows the answers. Green so why doesn't God just post a list and say to the angels, you trust me? Post a list. God is trying to be transparent to the, all the beings in the universe. He's, he's saying, I am an open person. See what I'm doing. What understand that? what I'm doing so that we can have love here instead of always maybe doubting me like, trust. Like, like you did when Satan was saying things about me. You were kind of questioning, well, is he saying it okay? And God's saying, I am completely transparent. See everything that I'm doing. I believe that the angels would like it to happen faster, but because God wants it to be so transparent that he's exactly. going through each and every step so there will never be this misunderstanding again. We're not, uh, we don't have time to discuss this now. We've talked about this before, but God goes painstakingly slow through this whole process so that when it's all over, 
after the third coming, when we dwell on this earth, hopefully all of us and all of God's faithful people are dwelling with Him on this earth and able to travel to the universe, etc., there will be absolutely no questions in anybody's mind that God was completely fair. Or as to why I'm there. Yeah. And, and other, anybody will and have any question else, about why I'm there. Yeah. And whoever else is not there, why they're not there. So when it's all done, we all are going to have to agree, not because we're forced to, but because God will not bring it to a conclusion until this is true. We will all agree that God did it right. That's what needs to happen. So why do things in heaven need to be cleansed? What actually happens on this anatypical Day of Atonement? Well, one verse that might help us is found in Hebrews 9.23. Those things, which are copies of the heavenly originals, had to be purified in that way, but the heavenly things themselves require much better sacrifices. Oh boy, now how do we, what does that mean? Well, look at another passage. Look at Acts chapter 3, 19 to 21. This is Peter's sermon to the people in Jerusalem. Repent then and turn to God so that He will forgive your sins. If you do, times of spiritual strength will come from the Lord and He will send Jesus who is the Messiah He has already chosen for you. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for all things to be made new as God announced through His holy prophets who lived long ago. Now well, in the more traditional translations it says He will, here it says He will forgive your sins. The more traditional translation says they will be blotted out. Well, you know, in other churches, they say there's absolutely no sin in heaven. And so they don't go along with this because there's no sin in heaven. But war started in heaven. Satan was in heaven. <clears throat> and I also think that our sins, I sort of think of it, stink to high heaven. Mm -hmm. And God is cleansing out the stink in heaven right now. I, I, I think it's kind of a, <laughs> it's kind of a metaphor. Mm -hmm. But... Whole thing's a metaphor. The <laughs> sins that we commit are s down here and they stay here. But you can take I the record of that sin. You can take there. the record of that sin and you can take it any place and act in it like it's the real thing, like the, you can write a check mm -hmm. on a bank account or something like that. And, and we're dealing with the records of what has gone on down here. Yeah. Okay, now let's talk about those records. This is really important. Now listen. If our sins are to be blotted out, forgiven, done away with, wiped off the record, that's what I was taught when I was younger, how can the record of the great controversy be preserved as an eternal safeguard against future rebellion? You see, if all the sins of all the saints have to be wiped out, then we have to have a gigantic Bible burning when we go to heaven. Because as the Bible is full of the sins of the saints. So will there be a Bible in heaven or will there not be a Bible in heaven? Will we remember in heaven or will our minds be empty in heaven of yeah. everything that happened? Okay, here's a quotation where Ellen White deals with that. The death of Christ upon the cross made sure the destruction of him who has the power of death, who would that be? Satan, who was the originator of sin. When Satan is destroyed, there will be none to tempt to evil. The atonement will never need to be repeated, and there will be no danger of any rebellion in the universe of God. That which alone, notice, that which alone can effectually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. What is it? The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. So if we understand the life of Christ and we understand why He had to die, that will prevent us from ever wanting to go back to sin ever, forever. The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. They're looking to what? His experience. The angels learn something really important about God from what Jesus did here on this earth. Right. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross, there would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. Human perfection failed in Eden. 
the paradise of bliss. I mean, we know those stories. All who wish for security in earth or heaven must look to the Lamb of God. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard. What does that mean? How long is this safeguard going to last? Forever. Forever. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889, paragraph 4. And people who take the more traditional approach to understanding all this pleading stuff, they're not sure what to do with a paragraph like that. Well, is all that necessary? Again, Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 489. The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. By his death, he began that work which after his resurrection he ascended to complete in heaven. So what, how could that be true? How can that possibly be true? I mean, we think his death upon the cross was the absolute ultimate event in the history of the universe, right? Yes. So the other well, part is what? His intercession comp in, in Zechariah consisted <coughs> of telling the devil, I've forgiven this guy's sins. Mm -hmm. And that's the essence of the intercession. And so when he says, here's how this man, this woman, would respond in heaven. Here's the way his life will be. He's safe to bring up here. They all say, so be it. Praise hallelujah. Okay. There, there's more, and, and I agree with you, there, but there's more to the story. Let's see if we can, we can work our way through this. Think about it very clearly. At the point when Jesus had just died on Calvary, remember there's been three hours of total blackness, and then there's a light shines through, he, he, he pronounces those last few words, he dies. Let's stop the clock right there. How many human beings at that point in history understood why Jesus had to die? No. None. Zero. Zip. Okay? How many of the rest of the beings in the rest of the universe understood why Jesus had to die? Be careful. You need to read the chapter in Desire Bages entitled, it is finished. Because not until that point in history did the beings of the rest of the universe begin to understand, or really, I shouldn't say begin, they sort of, they were not completely understand, understanding everything, but they pretty much understood the role of Satan and why he did what he did, and they didn't want to have anything more to do with him. Okay? That's they had decided who was telling the truth. They had decided who was telling the truth. And that was the issue. Okay. Have we decided who's telling us the truth? Yes. Human yes. beings. All human beings? No. Not even close. Most of, if you walked out in the streets and you asked, okay, how would you decide who's telling the truth, God or the devil? They would look, huh? <laughs> what are you talking about? So there's still a lot of undecided voters. There's a lot of undecided <laughs> voters still out there. And is that because and they don't know the issue? Do they don't job understand the issue. In form. <laughs> yeah. Because I have a the big election is coming question. soon. Okay. Okay. If when Jesus say it was done, it wasn't done. Is it because the Bible says so? But or is the whole thing about the pleading and whatnot a uh, product of what's his name? The plan of uh, salvation. Edson and <coughs> Bates. <coughs> who after the great controversy Mm -hmm. when Jesus didn't come when they say he, he, he would come which mm -hmm. they were not supposed to do because God said no one knows the hour or the time not even mm -hmm. the angels and it was a knee jerk reaction to that they came up with the Jesus is here and you know this, this is happening now yeah. I have a problem with that I have the victory admit. is done okay What's but the the here's, here's yeah let me, let me finish what I started to say and I think hopefully this will answer your question God, remember what I said a few moments ago, God says it will not be finished until even at the third coming. Let's think about what happens at the third coming. <clears throat> at the third coming, God is going to show a panorama in the heavens and every single eye, every single person who has ever lived 
is going to see it. The wicked outside the city, the righteous inside the city. And what's the purpose of all that? <laughs> even the wicked, even Satan is going to be down. If, if Philippians 2, Isaiah 45, Romans 14. Even Satan is going to be down on his knees saying, yes, God, you did everything you could possibly do to save people. I'd like to take Yoli's question. Mm -hmm. When he said, it is done, mm -hmm. what was he talking about? What was done? And I would postulate that his defeat of Satan, his living a perfect life was completed and he could die. Yeah. That's what was done. What he came there, was to a, there was a whole lot in the rest of the plan of salvation that was not done and is going on now. Okay, so coming back to your question, what's going on right now in heaven is this. God is saying, okay, folks, to angels and the beings in the rest of the universe, are there any of you that have any questions about these people I'm planning to bring to heaven? We're going to go over every name. Anybody who has a question, this is your chance. Okay, we're going to go over every name. Da -da 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 -da. And we're going to go from starting from Adam down to our generation. He's going to go over every single name and he's, in, he's going to explain why he says what he does. Jesus is going to say, this is why I think this person can or cannot be saved. Satan is going to make his accusations back and forth. But the jury is going to, when it's all done, see, when it's all done, the question isn't just that God makes a pronouncement. He could do that at any time. What happens at the end is that everybody out there and at the, after the third coming, every one of us will say, yes, God, in regard to every single person's name, you did it right. And that's what ne God needs to accomplish. So we need to talk a few more minutes. Surely as Seventh-day Adventists, we do not have any questions about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Not only are there many references in the New Testament to the second coming, but also we could ask the very probing question, if Jesus did not plan to come back the second time, what was the purpose of his coming the first time? Careful students of the Bible and the writings of Ellen White realize that in our day, there are no more prophecies to be fulfilled except those directly connected with the second coming. And I quote once again from Ellen White, as the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ draws near, satanic agencies are moved from beneath. Satan will not only appear as a human being, but he will personate Jesus Christ and the world that has rejected the truth will receive him as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. They will accept who? Satan. Satan. So Satan's going to be a person walking around on this earth? That's right. Ellen White, Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, April 14, 1896, paragraph 6. Also, the easier place to find it, 5 BC, 5 volume, volume 5 of the Bible Commentary, 1105, uh, Paragraph 8. He's going to be on C-SPAN and, and... He's going to make himself visible everywhere. He's going to think, he, he's going to make every one of us, he's going to face us and he's going to say, you know, whatever. And we have to face him and say, what you said about God is wrong. Do you think he's going to have holes in his hands? Probably. I think yeah. you skipped a point that's very important okay. a couple paragraphs please, back. Please help me. Number 19. Okay. Mm. So then if that. we are suggesting that Christ has to plead with his Father on our behalf to convince him to love us, forgive us, and save us, we are presenting a pagan picture of God. Yes. Pagan. Pagan picture of God. That's John what the 16, pagan... John 16, 26. Yeah, John 16, 26. And what does John 16, 26 say? Jesus himself says, maybe we should look at that. Thank you very much for bringing that to our attention. Look at John 16, 26. Just so long, and actually we should start with verse 25. Jesus speaking to his disciples at the very end of his ministry here on this earth. I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. Now, if Christ is telling us plainly about God, we should be listening with all ears, right? When that day comes, I will ask, uh, 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 you will ask me, him, in my name, and I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from the God. Jesus himself says at the end of his ministry here on this earth, I will not plead 
for your on for your behalf on your behalf. You can speak with the Father yourself. You Is can. that ever quoted without the not in there? Very often. It's happened many, many times. People have quoted that verse and left the not out. So Jesus will not plead with the Father for us. We're to speak to the Father ourselves. That's so, what he said. There's a story about some uh, minister from another part of the world, and he saw that uh, quotation in a, in a book, and he says, if God, damnable heresy, if God isn't pleading with, or, or Jesus isn't pleading with the Father, all is lost. All is lost, <laughs> yeah. But, okay. but we will ask in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, as a child. And we'll, but we'll be speaking directly to the Father. In fact, Revelation 1, verse 7 <clears throat> assures us that when Jesus comes, every eye will see him. It, this is no secret rapture. So we cannot be deceived. No. Surely we need to be alive and awake and not sleeping. We could be deceived, be deceived, by, the, be deceived by the devil, but when Christ actually comes, the, all the time for deception is gone. It's past. It's over. But there is no reason for us to be overly anxious or even set timetables for the second coming. Jesus himself told us plainly that the reason, John 13, 19 and 14, 29, the reason for these prophecies is so that when these things happen, we can have faith. One of the blessed hopes of Christians is the hope that those who have died believing in Jesus will be resurrected at the second coming in time to join the righteous who, was, who are still living, and both groups will ascend to heaven with Jesus Christ. And the best place for that is 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, start with verse 12, read up to verse 16. 1 Corinthians 15, 13 to 25, Romans 8, 11, Philippians 3, 20 and 21, etc. And these verses, Paul made some very powerful arguments in favor of that resurrection. And the main, most powerful argument is Jesus himself did it. As Christians, we believe that we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. I picture that grave, <clears throat> that graveyard we have by the Adventist church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, John 14, 23 promised us that Jesus will come back and he will take us home to live with him. While we may not be able to give a thorough, well-thought-out, and well-reasoned explanation of every detail of our teachings about the second coming of Jesus Christ and the pre-advent judgment that precedes it, does it make sense to us? Are we truly looking forward to the second coming? Are we ready? How soon will we be ready? And our question is for you. How soon will you be ready? See you again next week.